without a cause. And Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan. And Saul vowed, as the Lord lives, he shall not be put to death. Then Josh, Jonathan called David, and Jonathan told him all these words. And Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence, as formerly. When there was war again, David went out and fought with the Philistines and defeated them with a great slaughter, so that they fled before him. Now there was an evil spirit from the Lord on Saul as he was sitting in his house with his spear in his hand, and David was playing the harp with his hand, and Saul tried to pin David to the wall with the spear, but he slipped away out of Saul's presence. So he struck the spear into the wall, and David fled and escaped that night. Then Saul sent messengers to David's house to watch him in order to put him to death in the morning. But Michael, David's wife, told him, saying, if you don't save your life tonight, tomorrow you'll be put to death. So Michael let David down through a window, and he went out and fled and escaped. Michael took the household idol and laid it on the bed and put a quilt of coat's hair at his head and covered it with clothes. When Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, he's sick. Then Saul sent messengers to see David, saying, Bring him up to me on his bed, that I may put him to death. When the messengers entered, behold, the household idol was on the bed, and the quilt of goats at his head. So Saul said to Michael, Why have you deceived me like this, and let my enemy go so he's escaped? And Michael said to Saul, He said to me, Let me go. Why should I put you to death? So David fled and escaped and came to Samuel. Father, thank you so much for your living word with all its relevance for us. Thank you for the joy of singing your praise together. So wonderful to focus on you, to sing about that wonderful name, to sing about this mighty God, one who's conquered death. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to put other things aside and really focus on you. And we pray right now, Father, for the help of the Holy Spirit so that what we do together really benefits us and really glorifies you. So come, Holy Spirit, be our teacher. We invite you right now. Come, Holy Spirit, rest upon us. Lead us into truth, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So here are a number of relationships. Saul, the king, David, the young captain now, Jonathan, Saul's son, Michael, his daughter. These characters are going to attract our attention this morning as we look at them and as one plays on another and as envy and jealousy begins to dominate the scene, we see how it affects these different relationships, just like in our modern world. These things surface crises suddenly hit our life. And it's how we handle a crisis that very often affects years to come. How we speak, how we act, what we do in such a moment. So here, Jonathan, we're going to look at first. Jonathan, I'm calling him Jonathan, the faithful friend. We met him early in the chapter. In fact, you can meet him earlier in the story of Samuel, where it says that Saul and the son of jo uh, Saul's son, Jonathan, was knit to the heart of David. They, they became real friends. They became heart-knitted together, a bit like Starsky and Hutch, if you're that old, or Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. You know, we love these stories of guys who are together, they stand shoulder to shoulder, and they became real good friends, solid, solid friends. Friendship's a beautiful thing. It's more than acquaintance. We've got many acquaintances, maybe in the room here this morning, all sorts of settings. We have people we're friendly with. And then we have friends. Yeah, friends are beautiful. It's a beautiful privilege to have friends. Most of us would only have kind of a handful, perhaps, of friends. People we, we really bonded with. We would call them our friends. You know, you know, it's not like we would... It says here they made a covenant together. We don't often do that sort of thing, but we know where we are. And you often, if you're a parent, you have teenage children, you say, well, oh, isn't she your friend? Well, she used to be my friend. She's not my friend anymore. 
It's like, well, we know what friendship is. And, well, she crossed a barrier. Something happened. And, yeah, she was my friend. She's not my friend now. I'm not talking about friend on Facebook. I'm talking about real-life friendship where you can relax together. One of the characteristics of being friends, you don't have to guard your language. You can be relaxed. You can be on one another's trust. You can know what the other one's thinking, really. You can almost expect favors, ask favors from friends. They're available to help. They're kind of loyal. You know, you know that in your absence, if someone said, well, he said that, you said, no, he wouldn't have said that. He's my friend. I know, I know him very well. It's wonderful to have friends. Life is very rich when you've got friends. Maybe even as I'm speaking, you're thinking of some of your friends. People will think, yeah, it's so great. I'm so grateful for friends. I'm not alone. I've got friends. Certainly in the church of God, that should be our experience. We have those that we know, those who come and stand with us and pray for our baby, those who are nearby, those who we can draw on, those that we love and trust and know. And these two were really good friends. But their friendship became very tested now. Now, in David's absence, Jonathan's father, Saul, is saying, I'm going to kill him. I want my servants to kill him. And suddenly the friendship is under strain. What, what's he going to do? This is my father. This is the king. He's, like, he's the king. And, and he's going to kill David. And, and, but I'm David's friend. What, what do I do? What do we do when friendship is strained? What do we do when the person we are hoping to be loyal to, ah, oh, it's going to cost me something. And here we find Jonathan does brilliantly. He, he confronts his father. says, hey, come on, father, wait. I know you're the king, but listen, and we read the passage. Hey, this guy benefited you. He fought that battle. He's, he's never been against you. Come on, come on. And actually Saul, and we're going to see how unreliable Saul is as we go through the story, Saul changes tack quite quickly and he even makes a vow. He says, no, it's okay. David will not die. David will be okay. I'll, I'll look after him. No, no trouble. And, and so Jonathan's friendship means a lot. Jonathan's friendship saves David, friendships are meant to be like that. They're meant to be reliable relationships. I wonder if you've got many friends. It's great for us to cultivate friendship. To become friends, you have to show yourself friendly. Friendships don't just drop out of the sky. You have to work at them. But it's so lovely when you've got friendships, when you feel no, we know one another. We stand together. It's going to be our way. We want to be friends with people. And we know another friendship that got very tested in the Bible. You know, Jesus made friends. He called guys to be with him. They were with him day and night. They, were, they all slept rough, 12 of them with Jesus. He took Simon Peter into incredible friendship. He took him to a, ma a mountain where his glory was revealed. He took him into extraordinary signs and miracles. He was hugely privileged. But then there came this time, there came this moment when Jesus suddenly, suddenly the crowd had got hold of Jesus. Jesus, who seemed so invincible, who could walk through a crowd, suddenly they've got him. And they begin to punch him and deal with him. And then Simon is not far away, and he's just standing a bit further, and, uh, and someone comes to him and says, aren't you with him? He says, no, I don't know him. No, surely you're with him. You're, you're Galilean accent. You're the same. You've got this northern accent. You're, you're with, no, I don't know him. I don't know him. In the end, he curses and swears and says, I don't know him. Son of Peter, a terrible friend. Completely failed. Didn't stand. Didn't stand with his friend. Has to be restored later. Jesus, full of love and kindness, says, Satan's desire to have you to sift you. The Bible's unashamed in speaking about not only himself as the authentic God, the creator, a real person, but also that there's evil. We're going to see that evil comes in against King Saul. But Simon Peter knew something of that. Suddenly he sifted. Some, suddenly he said, I didn't expect this crisis. Although Jesus had warned him. I didn't know I was going to be asked to stand up like that. And suddenly he, he hasn't got what it takes. This whole story is all about crisis. Suddenly you're in a crisis. And can I handle this? Tragically, Simon Peter, good. Jonathan, Jonathan did brilliantly. He stood his ground. He faced up to his father. And even that terrific cost, actually, because Jonathan's 
due to be next king. He's the son of the king. And by standing with David, he's, he's risking his own position. And Saul recognizes that, but Jonathan is a great, great friend. He's a great friend. Let's move on then, because some of us would say, well, actually, my dearest friend is my husband, my wife. You sometimes see that. You see that on Twitter. You see that on Facebook. We're celebrating our ex-anniversary. My dearest friend, my greatest friend, my wife. Well, here we're going to see a wife who, yes, she's loving, but sadly, she's a vulnerable woman. Suddenly, a child comes in the marriage. You know, crises don't ask permission. You have to make appointments, don't you? See the dentist to do things. You get the date, you know, I'll see you on such and such a date. Or I'll arrange to see you. Can my secretary, yeah, yeah, you can see me on such and such a date. Crises don't ask permission. They're suddenly in your face. And suddenly Michael is in a terrible problem. Suddenly she's face to face with a problem. Uh, and Jesus said this, guard your heart with all diligence, for from it proceed the words of life. From, from your mouth proceed things that can spoil or wreck. Jesus had to confront. Jesus' biggest enemies were religious people. It was religious people who slaughtered Jesus. I know our, 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 our movies like to say, well, the Romans did it, but really it was the religious people who were really angry with Jesus. They hated Jesus. And they, and they got angry with Jesus because of things that he did and his disciples did. So sometimes they would walk through a field and just take off the head of a corn and rub it in their hands and eat the corn. And they said, this is outrageous. This is outrageous. You should do the ceremonial washing. They're not just talking hygiene. We might wash our hands before eating. They're talking about a special ceremony before eating. They would take the equivalent of an egg cup of water and pour it between each finger. They'd roll their sleeves up, and this is what they would do each time. This ceremony, this religious nonsense. And they were taken up with religious nonsense, and Jesus cut through it. He went into the temple, turned the table over. So you religious people, you're robbing ordinary people of knowing God with all your nonsense. You're furious with them. And they said, well, it's important. It's what goes into the mouth. He said, Jesus said to them, it's not what goes into the mouth. It's what comes from the heart out of the mouth. That's what defiles a man. It's what comes out of the mouth. Just keep your heart, because what comes out of your mouth reflects what's in your heart. Far more important than whether you do these ceremonial washings or go through these religious externals. God's far more interested in the heart and sadly, Michael is found out in this. Now, Michael, they were married. I mean, she was probably a stunner, eh? Because uh, David wanted to marry her. She was the daughter of the king, no less. And uh, they, uh, you'll find out in the story that Saul said, whoever wants to marry my daughter, he's just got to kill a hundred Philistines. And David was so up for this, he killed 200 Philistines. So this is a good, oh, wow, Michael, he's pretty keen on Michael. And uh, yeah, they, they get married, and she, it says, she loved David. I mean, what is there not to love? The guy is amazing. He can take out giants. He leads the army. The Bible says he's extraordinarily handsome. He can play the guitar or harp or something, and he can sing, and he can write poetry. I mean, the guy is amazing. The guy is amazing. She is totally besotted with David. She wants David. Oh, I've got to have David. And wow, this is the, it's like the end of a movie. They came together. Life is a bit more than that. Life is a bit more than that. Sometimes we feel, if only I could marry him, then I'd be happy. And so many of our movies finish, and then they got married. They, that, that's, that's the whole goal. But really, it's not enough. It's not enough. I remember once when we, we used, had several young men live in our home with us over the years. I remember one of them was getting ready for his wedding, and, it, and his, his fiance was putting all this stuff on Facebook week after week. He's so wonderful, I can't wait. He's so glorious, I'm so excited. And I thought, this poor guy, uh, <laughs> inevitably, she, she is going to be very disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> she is setting all our hope 
on him. I mean, it's just disastrous. I mean, one way, another thing will go up, another, and I think, oh, God, help them through. This is terrible. She is so thinking he's so wonderful, and he's not. You know, he's a young guy. <laughs> he, he's lived with us. He's fine. He's okay. But he's not, he's not that. He's not that. You can't, you can't build life on that. I mean, David, David's amazing, but he's not enough. And we, I need to kind of warn people, when you're coming to marriage, don't get that image that this is the answer. It's not the answer. You can't put all your hope there. You can never hope that, wow, he's going to be everything to me. You need, a, you need some deeper roots in your life. You need something that holds you more steady, lest you should put on them something that they are not able to handle. Because suddenly when crisis comes... It's not enough. When crisis comes, she can't handle it. When crisis comes, we find out she hasn't got roots, and she's terrified. Suddenly, she hears, my man's going to die. And she says to him, you better go, or, or tomorrow you'll be dead. She's panicking. She immediately panics. She's got no secret life. She leans on pretense straight away. Let's hide. Let's, let's pretend. She's still got an idol in the home. She's not really knowing the living God. And, and so she said, we'll put the idol in the bed and let's put this, that pretend to be hair. Uh, and and when, when they come, we'll say, no, 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 he's, he's still there, he's not very well. She begins to hide behind pretense. Not like Jonathan, her brother, who said, no, this is wrong. This should not happen. He's a faithful man. Why are you coming against him? No, no, she's into panic mode. She hasn't got any roots. It's so important, beloved, that we've got roots in ourselves. That we don't think, if I can only have him, if I can only have her, life would be wonderful. No, we need, we need deeper roots than that. We need something that will stand the test of time. So that the crises that come, inevitably come, don't shake us to the core. We know, no, no, she's a girl, he's a guy. Yeah, they're going to have problems. They, they, they're not going to be everything to me. I need something bigger than that. I need, I need to know God. Yeah, I fall in love, but I need to know someone who's stronger because the next thing we find, she lies about his being sick. She gets him out the window. He's escaped. But the next thing, when they come on to her, it says in verse 17, she says, he said to me, let me go. Why should I put you to death? She says to Saul, he threatened my life. I had to let him go. She's already broken honesty, told a lie. The first one I've told, the second one's easier. You get to use lying. You get to use things because, well, I feel more comfortable now. I've done it once. I'll do it a second time. Oh, he was sick. He's sick. Look. Okay, no, he's not. No. But he said to me, I'll kill you if you don't let me go. And so, hey, what about this beautiful guy? She's now blackened him. She's now given, if you like, more right to Saul to kill him. You threaten my daughter? You threaten my... I've got more reason now to kill David. So this girl who loves David, but suddenly in a crisis, under pressure, she says things she should never have said. It's out of her mouth, because her heart wasn't actually safe and secure. She wasn't rooted. She's, I don't know, some idol, whatever that is. She doesn't know God. It's so scary to commit your life to someone who doesn't know God. It's, you feel vulnerable in the end. I know for myself, I was, uh, I was at London Bible College and I, I saw this redhead girl that I kind of started falling for. And uh, I, I better quickly say she's a silver-haired girl now, in case you were wondering <laughs> who we're talking about here. Yeah, I began to get drawn to Wendy. Actually, it was while we are in Burgess Hill, of all places. We were on a, a college mission team, and I was asked to lead the team, and she was put on the team, and I'd been uh, often in her company, and we were particularly while we were here many years ago. And, and you know, I began to be friendly and stuff, and she had to leave the team early. And she wrote this letter to me saying, what a tremendous time we had on the team, wasn't it wonderful? Uh, but... Um, just in case, 
you were thinking of anything romantic, I just want to say I'm not interested. <laughs> uh, and, then she said, and then she said this, because, we both at Bible College, she said, because I'm determined to find the will of God for my life, and I don't want any distraction. Now, I've never had a letter like that before. <laughs> and if, uh, let me say this, if I was mildly interested before, I'm totally hooked now. <laughs> So it was, a, it, was a, it was a very cunning move, really. <laughs> no, no, I felt so safe. I felt, wow, this girl wants God. First and foremost, I thought that's what I've wanted. That's what I want. I want someone who wants God. I don't want to. I thought she was gorgeous. She's still gorgeous. But to hear her say, no, no, I, I want the will of God, that's all. I, I don't want to get distracted. I thought, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. That's what I want. That's what I want. And so I didn't take no for an answer. I thank God for years and years of marriage. I read this week in the Office of National Statistics, 42% of marriages in this country ended in divorce last year. 42%. What's that happen? Well, what happens is pressure comes on relationships. Jonathan, Michael, pressure comes. And suddenly you say things. Why did I say that? Well, I said it. He, he said he's going to kill me. Was that, was that true? No, it wasn't true at all. But in the moment, in the moment, I said, I wish I hadn't said it now, but I said it. We, that happens, that happens. Because our heart's not safe. Keep your heart with all diligence. Build something that's more than surface, more than, well, I think he's wonderful. He's tremendous. Look at him. He took out Goliath. What a guy. And he wants to marry me. And he killed 200. Wow. He must really want me. This is life. This is life. No, it's not. No, it's not. Under pressure, it's not. But he's so handsome. Yeah, under pressure, that's not enough. He's such a nice guy. Under pressure, that's not enough. We need to know, who am I? Where do I stand before God? Where do I stand before God? We're living in a generation that's turning its back on God. I'm not interested in Christianity, so restricting. Christianity's ruined your life, ties you down. Last year, Wendy and I had a meal with four or five other couples all separating, all celebrating rather, what we were celebrating, namely our 50th wedding anniversary. These poor Christians <laughs> suffering, hey, life, learning to live life, learning to cope with the pressures that we all know. This story is all about how do you handle pressure? How did Jonathan, his friendship, are you my friend or not? How did Simon Peter, Simon Peter failed miserably. Jonathan did brilliantly. He said, no, 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 it's not true. It's not true. Michael just said, panic, panic, panic. Get out of here. What is he? Well, he said he killed me. No roots. Dear friends, we need to, to build roots. Principles that are bigger than even our affection. Things you think, no, I feel so safe. When someone says, my wife, my husband, and my dearest friend, what you're saying is, we feel safe. I feel safe. I'm not wondering, what's she doing when I'm not around? I'm not wondering. I wonder if she'll... No, no, I'm not wondering. I'm not wondering. We're on safe ground. Why? Because I'm so special? No, not because I'm so special, but because God plays a real part in her life. That's the kind of person we're looking for. If I can say to the young people, that's the kind of person we're looking for. Someone you can feel, no, I'm absolutely safe with that one. Because God, they mean what they say. They're not going to, in pressure, say things they didn't really mean. And so we, we see Michael here, sadly, messes up under pressure. Their marriage is destroyed. Under pressure, speaking words that hurt. That's not true. Under pressure, she can't make it. Then the third one, I want to look at Saul. We're going to look at Saul. The whole story was because of this guy. The whole event 
comes out of this guy's horrible heart, which is very prone to envy and jealousy and anger and uncontrolled person. And that's, how, that's why the story happens. That's why all these, all these relationships get hit against one another. It can, be, it can be the one neighbor in your street. It can be the one guy in your office. It can be the one person in your family that always stirs it up. Some, the pressure comes from somewhere. And this is where this story, pressure comes from. This guy who can't handle it. He's got this root of bitterness. His whole week, he's a weak, he's a weak man. He's a weak man. No, he shouldn't have been. He shouldn't have been. He was the chosen king. He's head and shoulders above his contemporaries. He's, people look up to him. And at the beginning, he had a great victory. If you read the story, he led Israel into a great victory. He starts tremendously. He's one of the most tragic figures in the Bible. He starts so well. The Holy Spirit comes upon him. My, this guy looks very, very special indeed. Anointed by, by Samuel, victorious in battle, but ultimately rootless. It says this, he set up a monument to himself. If you walk around Westminster, you'll see monuments to Winston Churchill, Oliver Cromwell, all kinds of monuments, but they're usually after they died. This guy built one while he's still alive. Like Saddam Hussein, my monument. Usually other people do that. He set it up to himself. He was a weak man. He wasn't strong in God. He was a vulnerable man. So somewhere where he didn't do what Samuel urged him to do, he said, no, I, I obeyed the people. He's a weak man. He's not secure. And David's popularity undid him. He couldn't handle somebody else being applauded. We need to watch that in ourselves. We need to be aware of that. That can happen. We find out where we stand when we see somebody else praised. Somebody else applauded. You're trying to write something, somebody else writes it. Whoa. I remember when I was trying to learn golf. You know, that, thank you, Bernard. I'm just learning how to hold the club. Uh, you know, not like a cricket bat, hold it properly. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of in my middle years, not done it before. And I'm, you do this, you hold that. You're trying to, I mean, trying to remember every detail, everything, yeah, getting it right, uh, swing, do it. And then some 15 year old kid comes up, puts the plug, and just, <laughs> that's not fair, it's not fair. That's a comic one, if you like, but there are things that happen to us. You think, how come? Why? I'm just getting left behind here. Jealousy can creep up on us so t terribly and find us out. It says in Galatians, the work of, works of the flesh, which gives a horrible list of things, but includes fury and outbursts of anger. It's what natural man has capacity for. Fury, outbursts of anger. This comes out. And it also says this in Ephesians 2, the prince of the power of the air is at work in the sons of disobedience. What does that mean? Well, we are by nature children of disobedience. That's what the Bible calls the human race. We are children of disobedience. We are prone to disobedience. I've been a pastor for 50 years. I had five kids. They were all disobedient. Not because, oh, they're sons of a pastor. No, no, no. They, all, they don't have to teach them disobedience. They're naturally. We're all by nature children of disobedience. We need to be born again. As we're praying for dear Leo just now. We're not saying, oh, let's splash him with a little water. He's a Christian. No, no. He needs to meet Jesus sometime and be born a second time. Without that, we're we are by nature disobedient. By nature, we do the wrong thing. We look at the newspapers. Why? This is so bad. Why? Because the human race is spoiled, is wrecked. And then it says this, the prince of the power of the air, in other words, Satan, is at work in the hearts of the disobedient. Not only are we prone to be disobedient, we can have moments where we think, I, we just lose it. And sometimes you hear people say, I don't know why I did it. I was feeling this, I was feeling that, and then I, I just went over the top. I don't know why I did it. Even people in law courts, I don't know why I did it. I just, something else, something else. That's what the Bible teaches, that we are vulnerable to that. If we are ourselves children of disobedience, we're kind of open ground. 
And it says of Saul, an evil spirit got to him. And people get pushed beyond they want to go. They, they're already inclined to go that way. They get pushed further. And things happen. And, and wicked things happen. And someone gets knifed on the street. Why did you do it? I don't know why I did it. I don't know why I killed that kid on the street. I thought the others in the gang would like it. I thought, I'm all full of insecurity. I get left out of the gang if I don't do it. And, uh, and terrible things happen in our world because we're, by nature we're children of disobedience and the prince of the power of the air works. We need something deeper than a good-looking guy. We need God to do a profound work on us. And Saul was terribly, terribly vulnerable, as we all are. Our human nature is terribly vulnerable. And he could not handle seeing David get applauded. He was eaten up with jealousy. He couldn't celebrate his victory. It all had implications back for him. And some of us are inclined to that. Some of us maybe, it goes back to when we were children. And you found well, my parents always, always honored my brother more than me. And sometimes it's deep in our character because they all seem to favor him. They never favored me. Or there were all our sisters together. I, I felt I needed more place. And, I, and, and some of these things get formed early on and, and we need to deal with them. We need to face up to it. See, Saul at one point faced it, but he didn't have the roots to sort it because when he said, kill David, and Jonathan said, hey, hey father, listen, I mean, he killed the Goliath. He's a good guy. He's done, he's done you honor, really? He said, oh, okay, yeah, I'm wrong. I know I'm wrong. That came in our reading, didn't it? He said, okay, no one, no one should kill him. He's okay. And he takes another story. He's just won a battle. Let's kill him. He's so, he's so vulnerable. And this is where the story turns on this guy. He's so vulnerable. He's so open. Let's beware. If you know it's in you, Saul must have known it was in him. He didn't deal with it. We as Christians, we need to face it. Sometimes we feel, gosh, I, I shouldn't feel that. I'm a Christian. I shouldn't feel it. Let's put it to death. That's what the New Testament says. We are identified with Jesus in his death and his resurrection. That great new song talked about we've been resurrected with him. We've got new life with him. Sometimes you feel this old stuff in the flesh come up. Recognize it. Have nothing to do with it. Put it to death. Don't let it live there like a little worm growing in your soul all the time. Be ruthless. Say, no, I'm not having that. I'm not going to be that. I'm not going to let that shape who I am. Saul's a tragic figure. Let's move on to David then, our fourth character. David initially, hey, gets all caught up. His wife says, you better run, you better run. So he runs. I was interested. I heard Billy Graham say he was in a plane and he said, uh, there was danger. He said, I felt my first reaction was, I'm scared. And he said, I'm a Christian, why should I be scared? But then he said, hey, it's human nature. God's built it into us. It's built into us to be here. We should be alarmed at the possibility of death. It's, it's, a, it's a, uh, something in a principle that keeps us alive. But you move on. You don't stay there. David didn't stay there. It's interesting. We don't have time to read it all now, but if you look at your Bible later, you'll see Psalm 59. You'll see at the top of Psalm 59, this psalm is a psalm of David when Saul sent men to watch his house in order to kill him. Now, those statements at the beginning of Psalms are inspired scripture. They go right back into the earliest, earlier scriptures. So that's where that psalm belongs. What happened inside of David is written in Psalm 59. It's written, it's, you'll see it in your Bible. When Saul sent men to watch his house in order to kill him. So it starts with, Lord, save me from my enemies. He's under pressure. And then just to look, we just look at some of the highlights of the psalm. We won't look at all of it, it's too long. But some of the highlights. He begins to remind himself who God is. He says, Lord, you're the Lord of hosts. You're the God of Jacob. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. The Lord of hosts is God of heaven's armies. That's what David knew. When David went out against Goliath, he looks just like a kid. He's got a sling. 
But he knew, hey, Lord, you're the, you're the God of heaven's armies. I, I come against you in the name of the Lord. That's what he said. He, he knew more than, hey, run away, run away. He knew more than that. And in the psalm, he reminds himself, says, Lord, you're the head of heaven's armies. You're on my side. You fight for me. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. He reminded himself of the things he knew. That's why we love singing. There's no equal. There's no, there's no one compares with you, Lord. You're on my side. You're with me. And dear friends, we need to, when we hit crises, emergencies, moments, we need to say, look, my first reaction might be, God, what's happening? My next thing is come back to God. Remind myself of who he is. He's the God of heaven's armies. He's on my side. He's full of power. And he's the God of Jacob. What does that mean? It means he's the God of the individual. The man Jacob, who was pretty weak in himself, and had his name changed to Israel. So the whole nation's called Israel now. God's covenant love. He reminded himself of what God was like. He stepped into that. And then I love this. It says in verse 4, he says, For no guilt of mine this thing's happening. That's interesting. Sometimes when we go through pressure, we tend to think, perhaps I've done something wrong. Maybe God's punishing me. I hear Christians say that. We're going through a tough time. Maybe God's punishing me. No, David knew better than that. I'm innocent. And as Christians, we should be able to stand there. Dr. R.T. Kendall said, people think God's getting his own back. He said, no, God got his own back at the cross. God is not getting even. God got even at the cross. God dealt with my guilt at the cross. God dealt with your guilt. God dealt with guilt. Jesus said, it's finished. I've done it. I've taken away guilt. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. You're going through a tough time. Do not say to yourself, maybe God's punishing me. That's wrong. It's wrong thinking. Don't, don't go down there. David didn't go there. He said, no, I know I'm innocent. The believer should say, I know there's no condemnation for me. I know I'm free from guilt in this matter. David took great courage in that. God was not punishing him. Some of us have got enough religion. We believe in God, and we think of God who's against us. We haven't got a gospel that knows the God who's for us, whose son died in our place. And then it says in verse 8, You, O Lord, laugh at them. In other words, God, you're not panicking. You're enthroned. It's the same spirit that he had when he went against Goliath. Oh God, you laugh. You're full of power. You're full of might. And then he says at the end of the psalm, as for me, I'll sing of your strength. I'll sing joyfully of your covenant love. You've been my strength and my stronghold, a refuge in my day of distress. Oh, my strength, I sing praises to you. David, the psalmist, begins to praise and worship. He begins to focus on God, enjoy God. Beloved, we need to be doing that regularly, celebrating God, enjoying God. It's great to do that as husband and wife together, to build that secure marriage together in God. But he's our rock. He's our refuge. He's, he runs this home. That's why we're safe. Because he's at, he's at the center. And that's where David finds his joy. He says, the enemy comes to kill and steal and destroy. But God is my refuge. God is my strength. And David finishes celebrating. Yeah, we see friendships almost undermined. We see a marriage destroyed. Strife stirred up reputation may be ruined and we see a guy praising God and saying no no I'm going to come above this I'm going to win this and David is shaped gradually gradually shaped through crises through difficulties until he becomes the king God wants him to be he bursts on the scene as a young guy but God's going to make him into a man and for many of us it's pressure it's pressure that we learn to know God if you look back over the years, you think, I really got to know God in that pressure. When my name was being dragged in the mud, when I was being spoken against, all those kind of things, it's been, Lord, I need you now. And we find him at a way, in a way that we never would in ordinary circumstances. All these relationships come under pressure. 
but God is our refuge. He's our strength. He's enough for us. Let's trust him. Let's believe him. Let's put our confidence in him. And if perhaps you don't even know God yet, let me encourage you. The people of this book, they find God, they prove God, they experience God. Let's pray together, please. Can the band come up, please? We want to sing about knowing Jesus. Father, thank you so much that you're for us. Thank you you can rescue us. But Lord, when all kinds of relationships come under terrible pressure, Lord, you want us to build our house on a rock. Jesus said this, he who hears these words of mine and does them is like a man who builds his house on a rock. He who hears these words and doesn't do them is like a man who built his house on sand. And the storm comes on both houses. It's like they're on the same place. They're nearby. And one goes down and the other doesn't. Because they built on what Jesus said. He who builds his house on these sayings of mine and does them. Father, we pray. I want to pray, Lord, for our homes, our reputation in the workplace, our friendships, the ones we hold dear. Father, help us to win through in times of pressure because we know God is for us. We've come to know you. Knowing you, Jesus, knowing you is the key. And we do pray, let us know you, let us love you, let us serve you with all our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand to sing?